He put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke up from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at first. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The message today during this preaching series on American idols is toxic freedom. Before I begin the sermon, I'd be remiss if I did not give tribute to two civil rights icons who gained their freedom and transitioned to glory this week. The scripture describes describes what some call the stairway to heaven. And on July 17th, the Reverend C.T. Vivian, followed by Congressman John Lewis, took that stairway to be with God. They dedicated their lives to freedom as giants of the civil rights movement who never stopped fighting for freedom. So I asked for a moment of silence in their memory. God, thank you for these two dear gentlemen who fought for freedom and who did so under the Christian banner. May their memory encourage the movement of today and inspire us all. In Jesus' name, I pray. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. As you may know, I attended for undergrad the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. U of I is a prestigious institution. Its campus is beautiful and to me, the scenery of the buildings and the beautifully landscaped quad oozes of academia, knowledge and excellence. It's the reason I fell in love with university campuses and the reason once I graduated, I always dreamed of returning to and working within a campus environment. God indeed will give us desires of our heart. As a freshman at U of I and a few of, a few of my friends and I attended football games. My crew and I were among the few African Americans that attended football games. It just wasn't the thing to do for the African American populace of the campus. But the hustle and bustle, the energy of the campus on football Saturdays was incomparable. The highlight often was not the football game. It was the halftime show, like many football games. And at U of I, the halftime was game time. And it wasn't that there was such a great marching band at U of I, even though I became a band parent years later, I really couldn't tell you what I thought of the band at that time. It was the show of Chief Illiniwick that made halftime game time. 
the chief, the mascot of U of I, put on an amazing show, or so I thought at the time. He was a student, no doubt a young white male, who dressed in what I would have called at the time an American Indian costume, which I now know was the regalia not worn by the Illiniwick Native American tribes of Illinois, but worn by the Sioux tribe who occupied modern day Wisconsin and northern Minnesota. I guess the actual Illiniwick regalia wasn't regal enough for the performance but I digress. Chief Alina Wick, with his American Indian garb from a different tribe, danced on the football field, rousing the crowd who also made sounds and hand gestures to imitate the Alina Wick tribes to the delight of thousands of people in the stands, each home football game, basketball game, and volleyball game. From October, 1926 to February 2007. I'm ashamed that I was in that number, that number of students who enjoyed Chief Alinawick's halftime performance. The dance was to honor the Alinawick tribe, some might say. What's the harm, some might say. Ask the remaining descendants of the Illiniwick tribes. Oh, but you'll have to contact them in Kansas or Oklahoma, where they were forced to move onto reservations by the American government in the mid 1800s. For the 80 years that Chief Illiniwick performed in the regalia of another tribe on the campus in Champaign Urbana, while it had been almost 50 years since there were any federally recognized Indian tribes in Illinois, and there are none today, this is toxic freedom. Freedom that for over 80 years taught the hundreds of thousands of impressionable college students of my alma mater that you have the freedom to impersonate a people who were the victims of genocide in the name of colonialism in the name of school pride, fundraising, and just good old fun in the stands with plenty of beer and joy and laughter. Just because you can, with no regard for the pain, the injury, the theft, the genocide suffered by a people at the hands of the ancestors of the celebrants, this is toxic freedom. During this preaching series this month on American Idols, the spirit led me, I believe, to speak on toxic freedom as an idol because it is the root of so many of America's and Americans' abuses against God's creation of humanity and environment. Think of that for a moment, freedom, freedom as an idol. Americans, many Americans worship their freedom to do as they please, regardless of who it hurts, offends, injures, disrespects, kills, and with total regard for the disregard for the painful past and the ongoing suffering of other human beings and the land itself. The Constitution protects many of these freedoms, although laws against hate crimes and other laws have been adopted to try to prevent some of the toxicity of this country, much of the toxicity is completely legal. Laws on the books will never fully address the toxicity of the heart. Not completely sure what I mean by toxic freedom? Well, let me give you two more examples. Toxic freedom allows a presidential candidate to mock a disabled reporter during a campaign rally and also allows that same presidential candidate to offend or even attack women, Latinos, African Americans, American Muslims, and Muslims in general, and the said presidential candidate goes on to be victorious. This is toxic freedom. Toxic freedom is being blackballed as a professional football player for kneeling during the playing of the national anthem in protest of police brutality and racial inequality when the lyrics of the same national anthem include or the land of the free. 
and the home of the brave. This is toxic freedom. Toxic freedom stems, I believe, from ignorance and arrogance, a sense of entitlement, supremacy, and it can even come from scripture. In our text today, which is the Old Testament lectionary text for this Sunday, Jacob, one of the Hebrew patriarchs of the Bible, obeys his father who has instructed him not to marry a Canaanite woman, but to go elsewhere to find a wife, a related message for another day. While Jacob is on that journey, he stops to rest and has a dream, which we know as Jacob's ladder. During the dream, verse 13 says, and the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and your offspring. We have to be careful with the sacred text. We Americans must be careful with what we believe thus says the Lord. We must be careful with our freedom. We must be careful if we seek to please God. Now, I, I know that that might be confusing because the biblical writer is in fact quoting God. But in just 78 words, this quotation of God seems to justify chosenness, ethnic and religious supremacy, entitlement of past, current, and future generations, expansion, i.e. manifest destiny, and last a savior complex that you will bless all the people of the world. Some of the most damaging human mindsets which have led to some of the most destructive atrocities inflicted on creation. If one were looking to justify manifest destiny or land takeover that ultimately led to the fact that there are no federally recognized Native American tribes in Illinois, this scripture could be used to justify it. As a matter of fact, there are numerous passages of scripture which the biblical writers go even further, such as Deuteronomy 7, where Moses says to the Israelites, according to the biblical writer, when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are about to enter and occupy, and he clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and then the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations mightier and more numerous than you. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must utterly destroy them. Make no covenant with them and show them no mercy. Do not to marry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for that would turn away your children from following me to serve other gods. That's harder to preach than it is to hear. <clears throat> Excuse me, what do you do when the word of God or some other teaching or teacher you hold in high regard seems to affirm toxic freedom? Taking it further, what do you do when the toxicity is in you and in your family and your friends? Toxicity is in your circle of influence. Well, the first thing you might consider doing is fighting ignorance by educating. And the education needed depends on the ignorance displayed. Let's say with, let's stay with scripture for a moment. Just because people in the Bible did something doesn't make it right. Let me go to the extreme. There is rape in the Bible. Many instances throughout the Old Testament. It doesn't mean it's right. It means it's possible. Scripture, in my opinion, can be viewed as a mirror of humanity. It includes every atrocity humanity can inflict on another. 
So just because it's in scripture, it doesn't make it right, it makes it possible. The Old Testament stories, which are intended to represent a version of history of a people, were intended for an original audience to explain what occurred with their ancestors, to provoke a reverence for and a trust in God. And in many cases, the God represented in the Old and in the New Testament could be charged with operating in toxic freedom. Yet the toxicity of the Old and New Testament is redeemed through Jesus' teachings, the love commandments, and ultimately through the resurrection. As followers of Christ, we are resurrection people. And as we read the scriptures and encounter a toxic God, we must do so through the lens of a resurrected Jesus who is victorious over the toxicity, even the toxicity of the cross. If there's toxic freedom within you or your loved ones, whether fueled by scripture or some other form of ignorance, after you pray, and I encourage you to pray, you might attempt to educate and inform them. It's at least worth the attempt. But if the attempt becomes toxic, something that I learned recently, again, you might want to let it go and pray some more. This is where I appreciate the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, 18. Paul says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Sometimes it's not our job to help fix folks. But I'm excited about the education that will come from the Anti-Racism Task Force. For our, as our own Professor Curtis Evans has guided us, it will be education with the intention of transformation. That's worth writing down. Education with the intention of transformation. So attempt to educate, especially yourselves. And always pray. Going back to our text today, when Jacob awakes from his dream and hears God saying, I'm going to give you this land, verse 18 says, so Jacob rose early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. Jacob built an altar for worship and for prayer to his God. Is that the answer to toxic freedom? I want to say yes. I want to believe that prayer and worship humbles us and gives us reverence for God, softens our hearts, relieves our anxieties, leads to answers from a God that will be in line with God's will and God's way. And that this will be the loving response for God is love, right? So you would think that prayer and worship would be an answer for toxic freedom. Ah, but I cannot say that prayer and worship alone are the answers because if the God for whom you have reverence and the God for whom you seek answers is toxic or favors you as a people over all humanity, then the outcome of your prayers may simply reinforce your bad theology. How do I know? One image from my exploration in Ghana, West Africa, just a few months ago that will never leave me at the Cape Coast slave castle is that the chapel was positioned directly above the slave dungeon. Worshiping a God that you believe justifies your evil actions might only reinforce your evil actions. So education, prayer, and worship alone are not the answers to toxic freedom. Looks like I'm running out of options for addressing toxic freedom. Not so quick, for there is a prayer. Somebody say, there is a prayer that I believe is worth a try. It's also the lectionary text this week, Pastor Sarah. The lectionary never ceases to amaze me. It's Psalm 139. I encourage you to read it all. It even gets a little toxic in itself, but make sure you keep reading all the way to the end. For verse 23 and 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. 
see if there is any wicked in me, any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The work that is needed to address toxic freedom is heart work. And we all need a little heart work. First, we are all for sure susceptible to toxic freedom. For we've been shaped in a country that was built with the tools of evil through genocide and enslavement, exploitation and violence. We've witnessed it in education educational institutions such as my own from sports mascots to serp marketing campaigns. We have been immersed in toxic freedom. We've supported the NFL even now as they reportedly plan to play the black national anthem, lift every voice and sing while Colin Kaepernick remains blackballed. Many still can't wait to see if football will return in the midst of a pandemic. We are immersed in toxic freedom such that it feels normal like fish. We often can't see the water in which we are swimming. Paul says in Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. It's a spiritual battle for sure. And I believe we must build a devotional arsenal to counteract the toxic freedom with which we have been raised and live every day. So I suggest again this prayer from Psalm 139. You might want to say it with me. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. I've got to believe that God will honor this. And to that, add to your devotional another text, 1 Corinthians 6, 12. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I might be free to do whatever I want, but everything's not a good idea. As I said in a sermon earlier this week, sometimes we have to check ourselves. Earlier this year, sometimes we have to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. Add to your devotional arsenal the song we sang this morning. Listen again to the lyrics of verse 3 and verse 4 of God of grace and God of glory. Cure your children's warring madness. Bend our pride to your control. Shame our wanton, selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. Let the gift of your salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, God. Grant us courage, serving you whom we adore. I believe God will honor this prayer. Add to that the hymn of prayer today. Lead me, guide me along the way. For if you lead me, I shall not stray. Lord, let me walk each day with thee. Lead me, oh Lord, lead me. I believe that God will honor this. And to this, as I close, as Christians, we are in fact to be governed by love. We are resurrection people. Sometimes we don't think about that till Easter, but we're resurrection people. We've been redeemed from the toxic God and we've been resurrected. That's why Jesus was resurrected to overcome evil so that love and justice could be everlasting. When you struggle with the scriptures that seem to have no regard for life or for the other, Know that Jesus is the answer to the toxicity of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the toxicity he even suffered on the cross. Pray that God makes that clear to you. And when you are around people who use scripture or any other knowledge to justify their toxic freedom, pray, seek to educate Kate, but if that leads to more toxicity, let it go and let God do the work on their hearts and on yours. 
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.